So this evening, I will take you on a, on a trip, which was a trip for me to prepare for, because I never looked back in this kind of condensed fashion. And I've never really talked very much about what I did in my previous lives before I became institutionalized. <laughs> I became institutionalized in 1999, 89, sorry, I'm losing all these decades, which you see at the top. And I would like to talk about this arch which happened before I got institutionalized and got a real job. I did, uh, and so I'm just going to take you on certain islands which I touched on in these years before. And why I'm doing this is not only to go down memory lane myself, because that's usually pretty hurtful, uh, but I would like to talk about the things which influence actually the spaces and the venues and the program you encounter at MPAC. So when I was hired in 2001, 2002 to think about MPAC and what it could be and how it should be and what it would be, I certainly had to was based in what I had done previously. It was not a job where I was hired to do something which was totally alien to me. And I had worked from 1989 until 2002 uh, at the Center for Art and Media in Karlsruhe, ZKM Karlsruhe, which is a humongous center with uh, three museums and I was setting up the Institute for Music and Acoustics with artists and residencies. I was involved with defining the studios and just getting the program going. And then once I came to MPAC, I started out all over again, but not by, by having a boss, Dr. Jackson, but not having a boss like at ZKM, um, where I was just a small part of something. So I was very happy when I came to MPAC that I could was allowed to think about everything else. Uh, we will not discuss tonight if what I play to you is music or not. <laughs> if, if you just accept it, you don't think about the, if you don't like it, call it sound. If you like it, call it music. And that should give you some peace. These are the instruments we use to play this music. Uh, and I've done that for 20 years before I came here, playing on scrap metal instruments, on denaturalized traditional instruments like pianos without keys, and self-built instruments.
I will give you a little introduction into this. So this is improvisation uh, in the sense that when we started to play, like you see these pictures, someone went in this location, the other person in that location, and we decided, decided to start playing. That was it. So there was never a determination of how long it would be or some signal when to stop or when to continue. What is important, we hardly ever played a concert. We did not play for other people. We played for ourselves. At one point in time, we submitted recordings we had made of our improvisation to a composition seminar and competition in Switzerland and were invited. But that was really not what it was all about. You see, I, I'm not going to take you, I'm going to introduce you only to four different people who were pivotal to make me come to this place and stand here tonight. One is the person on the left, Gunther Lege. He is a organ virtuoso, got a con concert examination in organ. He's a composer and he's now also a little older, but with 85, he still climbed the 5,000 meter mountains in the Himalayas. So I always stayed at the bottom. So, so that was fine. Uh, I started taking organ lessons from him when I was 14. I was never a good instrumentalist. And I started taking composition lessons from him, private lessons, when I was around 17. And he made his money by playing the organ in a church. Now, churches have a different structure in Germany than in the US. It's, but. Besides that, he was playing the organ, and you see the pipe organ, and to the left was a balcony. And on this balcony were all the instruments which I just showed you before, which was really not too well for the ministers and pastors of that church. <laughs> but we crowded it with those instruments. We met on weekends mostly, but sometimes during the week. We, he had a little study in the tower of the church. We met, drank, smoked, I mean drank non-alcoholic beverages. We smoked cigarettes. <laughs> and we said, oh, let's go to the balcony and let's play some music. So we played some music and some, we were four or five people. We invented stories like going in a circle Someone starts a story and the other one continues. We painted drawings and pictures. So we did, and we did that for years on end. Now, this is Kurt Schwitters. He is a famous Dadaist artist from the 1920s, 30s, a little bit in the 40s. And he built this Malzbau in his home. Uh, he worked on this installation from 1927 until he left for Oslo. He left Germany in 1937. And this is a picture from 1933. And I, from where I grew up, where I was living with my parents and my siblings, could see across to the backyard of where Schwedes house had once been. And he was a very great influence to us, especially because Gunther, my teacher, had an original oil painting by Schwitters in his study. And the Dadaist movement somehow, as I looked back, really influenced me more than I thought.
we were not a group of professional musicians. It did not matter if someone had an education or studied music. It was a group of people who just came together. Part of us had studied music and others had not, which did not make a big difference here. And I did not know about deep listening, which Pauline Oliveros has been promoting here and in previous decades. But all we did was based on listening. So we did not look at each other. If someone did like this and then someone else did like that or reacted to it, it was only, we were actually quite shy. And which maybe the mu music is why the music is like this, because we were shy. So we just had this area on the balcony with the instruments we selected, and then we started playing, and we only listened. We did not look at the gestures or the, what the other people did. We never played with more than three or four people at a time. So it was not a big jamming session, because we discovered that if you play music where everything is based on listening, it's very hard to follow already four people playing. Two or three people are ideal, because we cannot separate all the different sources while we are playing. We never played in concerts. And I just mentioned Pauline. When I, I had a strange experience. So about 10 years ago, I listened to music which Pauline had in her archive. And it was a record, they were recording. So this music which you're listening to was recorded in the 70s. In the mid 70s, we started in 69, 70 with this kind of music. And all of a sudden, I discovered tapes which Pauline, Terry Riley, and Lauren Rush had recorded in 1957. And I was totally, totally stunned. I heard the music and said, this could have been us. And we were at two opposite parts of the world. And the music which Pauline, Terry Riley, and Lauren Rush had done in 1957, they did not continue down that path. So I, was, I offered to a German radio station to make two one-hour broadcasts on the improvisation of Pauline's and what we had done and how strange all these things are. Here you see a setup. We hardly ever played concerts. You see four people playing here. It's me on the left picture, you know, the bald head, you know? And yeah, it's, that started very early, so. <laughs> That was the end of the piece. We never used electronics but this old radio, 
which you just heard, because we were totally non-technology orientated. We had no idea how to deal with that stuff. But this old radio, and I was, as I was listening to this, I think radio today could not be treated like this anymore. It's so maybe an old instrument to be discovered. This was a big installation. You can see the person in the middle with a yellow hat to give you an idea of the sculpture. So this was done when I started my institutionalization job in 1991. And the title of this sculpture was actually a title of a short story by Kurt Schwitters. This was set up in a theater on a theater stage and it was used to perform, which we usually never did. And since I, at that point in time, had already my institutionalized position, I did not join them in playing. But I invited them to build this humongous sculpture, haul it down to south southwest Germany, set it up in the theater, and perform. In the mid-70s, I initialized one activity, and I just want to mention it. So you see that this is the center of Hanover, where I lived. And Hanover, at, the point, at that point in time, had the largest industrial fair in the world. It was a humongous big fair. And on May 1st, May 1st in Europe is the Labor Day, as opposed to here. And it had always been an issue for me why Labor Day, no one worked on Labor Day. So, so we decided to set our instruments up in the center of Hanover, where all the people who took the streetcar, the tram to the fair, would be coming by, all the ones in the good suits and all these people. And we took our scrap metal instruments and set up. I, I got the, the license from the city, so we got official barricades and we set up our work environment with these scrap metal instruments and performed a full day in that and made movements, obviously, and we worked, but nothing came out of it. And at one point in time, we created an assembly line down the sidewalk with 10 feet between each one and we just passed sounds down that assembly line. And nothing came out at the end again. <laughs> and then I remember very well one person came up to me, a gentleman, and said, could I take your place? <laughs> and I said, only if you stay for five minutes. And that was a deal breaker, so he left. <laughs> so it was the time when these things were done and it was totally natural to dream up these kind of things and just do them. My teacher friend Gunther and I also gave music lessons, music in quotes, where we met with children in this environment, starting with four-year-olds. And the parents were, how should I say, they thought it was great that we made music on these instruments with the children. So it was always one of, our, of us adults and then a maximum of two children. We met on the balcony for one hour weekly and we played in the dual sense of the word. We played music and we played. And I remember that one way a four-year-old always got rid of me is by wrapping me up in blankets. <laughs> so it was this, this playing with sounds, inventing stories or not, and just doing it. And later on, I also did it uh, with children from a hospital who were physically and mentally to different degrees. Uh, what's the right word, please? Different. different. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm always so PC incorrect. So. Yes. And, and that was a real great experience. We did these workshops actually also in schools. So in the time I was there, we'd, I did organized more than 400 workshops where we took, put all our instruments into a truck, drove to a school, all grades in Germany from first to 13th grade. 
we met with a class, we played pieces, two or three people of us, and asked the students, how do you think we played this music? And then they played in small groups and tried to listen to each other with these instruments, where we certainly, I knew, how every one of us knew what the red pot would sound like, the pots and pans we had. We knew the material. It was not just arbitrary stuff, because we had played so much on them. And these workshops were really a way to make money, which was good. And, and so we had like five, six workshops in a row in a school. And then we would pack up our stuff again or come for a second day and installed all these instruments and played with the children. And it was really a great experience to have had someone in second grade and then see them again in eighth grade. It was quite, quite interesting. <laughs> And then uh, in, in the end of the 80s, um, we were invited to go to Oslo. I was already working in an institution, but this was something I really wanted to do, and I'm quite sure I organized it. So in 1991, we packed our, all our instruments into a truck and took the ferry to Norway. We met with a sixth grade, fifth grade. <coughs> We set up our instruments, we did one week of workshops, then we took most of our instruments back and the class worked with their music teacher for the following year on improvisation and building instruments. Then in 1992, we came back for the World Music Days and I brought a Diaxis along, which was one of the very first digital audio workstations where you could record sounds, edit them, splice them and create an electronic kind of layer, and we developed a piece with that class, recording sounds, making this electronic layer, and developing a piece with the class, and performed it at the World Music Days. So this is a picture from the class in, uh, from the place in Oslo where we rehearsed with the students. Now I would like to play the shortest piece ever to you. As I, as I mentioned before, we did not make any decision how long a piece would be. We started, and then when it was over, it was over. Piece was over when someone was always surprised that it was over and looked at the others. So I, I told you that uh, Gunther was my composition teacher and he, tr he first told me not to study music because I was not gifted enough. I come to that, that I did it nevertheless later on. So in 1972, between 1972 and 1975, uh, I worked on a music with a choreographer. are two violas, one cello and one double bass, and they have to play like this in similar fashion for about 22 minutes, and after that their arms are <laughs> exhausted. So the choreographer wanted to do a dance called Song of Despair, where she wanted to uh, take the tension between an individual and the mass the desires of moving back as an individual into the mass of disappearing and of struggling against it and finding oneself, wanting to be separate and not wanting to be separate. So that was the direction the dance was supposed to go in. And I started out with a, taking it in a very literal sense, as you can tell here. So these are the 
it's the orchestra, the ensemble, playing this, and then there was a solo viola, basically playing the individual that dived into the mass and out of the mass, and we performed that piece. Let me play you a couple of excerpts. Uh, I will talk about the music notation later on. This is just uh, food for the eye. I wouldn't call it eye candy. Um, and this is a recording we did in 2001 with Garth Knox, who is a very famous viola player. And so let me play these excerpts. So everything the viola had to play was written down and notated and this going crazy is actually transmitted through the black ink on paper. <laughs> then in 1972, something really strange happened to me and I would not be here today if that had not happened to me. Uh, I went, so, that's it. so my Gunther, my teacher, told me, he had told me not to study music, and, and then he said I should go to the most famous summer courses in music in Germany and in Europe, which were the Darmstädter Ferienkurse, where all the big names were like Stockhausen, Xenakis, Lachmann, Ligeti, who gave classes and seminars. 
Then Georgi Ligeti, a piece by him we actually performed at the opening of MPAC for the choir Lux Eterna standing in the back of the hall. So Ligeti brought this guy along, who then turned out to be John Charney. He was actually at Stanford, and he was denied tenure, and things were not going well. He was with his family on a sailboat in the Mediterranean. So this guy came in, and I sat there, and he talked about computer music. I had not the faintest idea what that was. And then he played sound examples, like he played a, rec a recorded cowbell, Swiss, Swiss cowbell, which was running in big circles around me. There were four loudspeakers, one speaker in each corner. It was going in big circles. And then it came closer and closer and closer and closer and went just by my nose. <laughs> and I was totally impressed by that. And I thought, this is what I want to do. Now, it was a little long. So I talked to John and said, well, how, how can I do this? Well, anyhow, it became clear. First, I had to get a degree in music. So in order to get a grant, in order to be able to go to Stanford and do this stuff. There was no place in Germany up into the late in the 1980s where actually music with computers was done, even though in all other industrialized nations there were studios doing it, especially here in the United States, but all over the world. So it took me five years. And in 1977, I finally was able to get to where I wanted to get, even though it had taken me five years. But it didn't feel like it took me five years. I improvised music. I did many different things. So um, the CCRMA, pronounced Karma, is the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics at Stanford. And they were housed at, the, at sale at the Stanford Artificial La, uh, intelligence Laboratory. And you see this round building here. It does not exist anymore. It might remind some of you of the Google building. And I'm quite sure that this is a takeoff on this building. And it was an old, dilapidated wooden structure which housed the uh, sail that hosted Karma a computer research group. You should know that at this point in time, I'd never seen a computer. I'd never touched a computer. I was bad in math because I was told I was bad in math. <laughs> I had not the faintest idea. I only was obsessed with this is what I want to do. So these are the people who started, oh, this is a picture from 1975. There's a very famous European composer, Pierre Boulez. Uh, then there is John Chowning. Then on the right is Max Matthews, the great grandfather of digital music, who, who wrote the first music compiler. And Andy Moore, who was a, is still a very gifted um, engineer in the audio realm, who later on built the first digital studio for Lucasfilm. And these were the people. And as you can see, through the back door, there are the eucalyptus trees. It was just in the middle of nowhere with horses around and eucalyptus trees. And when I worked in this office, I used to pull my terminal outside. And I was sitting there among under eucalyptus trees and the smells and the horses. And I thought, this is how life is with computers. <laughs> uh, actually, Karma was the first online computer music system, which was built around 1969. Before that, it was an offline batch job, and you could never hear the sound. And it was a totally terrible process of finally being able to hear what you had programmed. So this is a ter typical terminal, which we used. And all the electronic, all the computer music which I'm playing to you in the, over the course of this feature film, um, were programmed with on this kind of terminal. So it is what people today call terminal. And as a terminal window, it was only ASCII, only text. And I'm sorry, I'm, 
I'm not sounding only like an old man, but I am one because I'm talking about things where the younger people have no idea that it was not always around. Now, the interesting thing is I came to sail and I thought that was everywhere in the world. And I will give you a little insight into that. So I was there as a so-called postdoc, even though I don't have a doctorate, uh, which meant I was free to do whatever I wanted to do. I did not have to take classes, and my introduction was as follows. I arrived, and the big heart of John Chowning had made it possible for me to come without any academic accreditation or being famous or any of this. Then I was told, okay, here's a book on Algol, which was a programming language. Read it. <laughs> this is a terminal. This is a stack of manuals. Good luck. <laughs> So you can imagine what that meant for the first three months. I was banging my head bloody against the wall because I did not know. I'd never studied logic or nothing. OK. So this is John McCarthy. He was actually the founder of the Stanford AI Lab. And he's one of the giants in computer science and cognitive science. And he coined the term artificial intelligence. And he was influential on Algol, and then help me with the language, Lisp, Lisp, Lisp language, which was the basis of lots of AI programming at the time. And he actually was kind enough to house the computer music people who were not looked at in a good way by Stanford because they didn't create money. It changed when. Karma had the, <coughs> happened to have the one patent in music technology, the FM patent, which generated for a couple of years more money than any other patent at Stanford. And that's when the anointment <laughs> happened. So he was kind enough to, to allow us, to allow people like me to use the computer, which is, is totally crazy. So you have all these very high-powered computer scientists doing their research, and then a person like me. But it, it, but it was a time, like in the, I remember one, one night at 11 o'clock, the main KL10 PDP went down, and no one moved to boot it up again. So I went to someone and said, well, what should we do? You know, everyone is just twiddling their thumbs. They said, well, just go and boot it. And that's how it was. So I had to go there and go down the list and do all the toggle the switches and put on the tape. And I was totally scared because there were all these qualified people. But I guess if you, there is a level where if you don't know enough, it's good because you just do what you're told and read. <laughs> so this was the AI lab up in the hills. And I thought, as I mentioned, that this was the environment which existed everywhere. So you see this cart driving around autonomously. Uh, it, they started building it in the late 1960s, which tells you how long the autonomous driving development has been. This is now 40 years, 50 years of development, and we are still not there yet. Uh, it had vision, computer vision was connected to it. There was a robotic arm that learned how to, to put building blocks on top of each other. It had all the degrees of freedom of doing these things. I could actually search the AP, the Associated Press, and the New York Times wire. So it was not digital. It came over wire, you know, a teletype. And it was ingested into the computer. And I could do searches like you do today in Google. And you say, I want to know what happened under, with these keywords in that such and such a time frame. And I got it. And I thought that's how life with computers is. Uh, so the, the research at, at, the, at sale was in the basic AI research, natural language processing, self-verifying programs. And that's what I was dumped into. And I took it as this is how things are. And man said, it is not good that I'm alone. I will make a helpmate who will be around me. 
and man created the computer in his own image. As his partner, he created him. And man took the computer and put him in a basement so he might sit there and compute. <laughs> and the Lord commanded man, thou shalt let him tap into all sorts of useful wellsprings on earth, but thou shalt never feed him from your source of good and evil, or else it will go bang. <laughs> man said, but this is semblance for my semblance and self for my self. How should it go bang? Rather, on the day we feed him from our source of good and evil, our eyes shall be opened and he shall be like us and we shall be like him. I will come to the event for which I wrote this. That was in 1979 when I came back and had learned a little bit. While I was at Stanford, I did many different things, and I did collages. This was not really, but somehow in the tradition of Max Ernst. And Dover Books had these, this collection of stuff where you could make collages. And I thought I had to think about this relationship of, from, of man and machine, and you see the typewriter and the piano and the foghorn and the loudspeaker and <laughs> her hands are a little too big. So this was an instrument uh, which was used, I think, in the 17th and 18th century also with piglets. So they had keys, and when they struck a key, a nail would hit under the tail of the animal, and they would squeak. <laughs> you saw this on the announcement. And I was very interested in graphics and typography and such things, but I had only a typewriter. And I will talk a little bit now about, about typography and music printing, and how that all came about in those years. So up to then, I could only use a typewriter as a tool to combine words and meaning with that graphic appearance. This is an excerpt of a thing I did. I always wanted to write a novel which consisted only of footnotes, <laughs> where, where, where you were invited to basically construct the original text out of the footnotes, <laughs> which I think is a very immersive undertaking. <laughs> so I didn't get to write to the, the novel yet. <laughs> so I only used this format to write a kind of um, report or write up on an artisan residency I was able to have in some very remote area of Germany. And I still look at it, and I think having only footnotes actually makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so I talked about Kurt Schwitters. And in the 20s, he was very much involved with, with graphic and with printing. Actually, his, his, uh, the way how he supported himself was as a graphic person. And they used. Uh, moving letters, movable letters, to print in non-traditional ways. So Dada, as you can see on the left-hand side, used many different fonts uh, to create a different channel of communication. <coughs> and on the right-hand side, it's a children's book by Kurt Schwedders, where he actually used the movable letters to represent characters that do certain actions. So I was totally frustrated by my typewriter the whole time. And I don't know how many of you know Letraset or rub-off letters, which came about, I guess, in the 60s, where you had these, these, as you can see on the left, you had these letters on a transparent piece of foil. You would put it where you wanted to have the letter, and then you rubbed it off. And then you took the next 
letter. There were different styles available, different fonts, different sizes. And at the bottom right, you see an announcement, which I had to make. Uh, a series I, start, I started with two friends in 1975 uh, with theater, new jazz, improvisation, text, dance, and new music. And I basically created the, with letter set this kind of outline. I photocopied it, and then I put it in my typewriter, and I typed in the stuff, and then I went back to the copy shop and got the copies, and then we distributed them. These rub-off letters, I like them very much. <laughs> and so they allowed you to do actually things which were a little different. And at that point in time, it must have been a challenge for me, the word I, because it turned into a cross. I told you that the piece for the viola was all handwritten by me. You see an excerpt on the left side, a little crooked because I was never quite straight. And, but things had to align in exactly the right way. And on the right-hand side, you just see another piece I wrote for the wooden instrument that's sitting over there. So actually, being a composer who writes down in the Western tradition is quite a tedious and fun job, because there's so many challenges. If you look at Western music, this is part of a score by Wagner. And squint your eyes, and you will see that there's a very good distribution of gray over the page. I will tell you a little bit about music printing now, which I had to learn. It's probably is music, Western music notation one of the most complex systems, graphical systems that exist. If you look at this page, so you see the two brackets at the top. They are time-wise the same two duration. These two bars, which are different, taking different space on the page, are actually the same seconds of duration. Every bar on that page has the same duration. So if you read it and you have a long bar, you have to read faster than when you have a small bar. Furthermore, you see that at the end of, to the right, there is a line, a bar line, which goes all the way up and across. And it starts with the bar at the, at the front. So how does a person who prints this music get all this organized on a page that it ends with a bar, that you can turn the page, that everything which, where you see the red line in the middle, what is on that red line happens at the same point in time and has to happen together. And there are 22 staves, so 22 different instruments group, which the conductor has all to synchronize, but which the music engraver has first to engrave. And so the engraving happened into metal and mirror-like. Because if you want to print it, you have to engrave it, cut it into the metal as a mirror. So it comes out right the other time, other way. So music engraving is totally complicated. You see these people and their tools. But first, they have to lay out the page with a compass and measure everything so things align vertically. They meet the horizontal boundary of the staves on the page, that they squint your, their eyes so the gray distribution is pretty continuous. There are no sharp contrasts. So this was, this is, this, this has been a, they moved to Letra Set because this is obviously a very expensive way of producing music. Once Letra Set came about, you could do rub off. Uh, and then back to Stanford, the AI lab, there were two people who worked on the graphical side. The top is Leland Smith, who wrote the score music printing program. And the page of the solo viola piece, which I showed you, I printed in 1978 and had set on computer on this awkward terminal. No, it was actually a triple 
I terminal was a vector-based terminal that where this could be edited, like the one you see at the top. And Don Knuth is one of the most famous computer scientists, uh, and I had no idea who he was. And he developed the typesetting language Tech, which is now known under LaTeX quite a bit and is used. And he developed it so the complex mathematical formulas could be integrated into a publication of letter of into, into publications, and uh, mathematical sim symbols can be as complicated as musical notation, but they usually don't go for 650 pages on end. So both of these people tried to actually develop programs which measured up to the traditional way of either printing with movable letters, which can be very, very complicated, or to the traditional way of engraving, to reach the same level of quality. So I was lucky and happy, and I thought this is how things go, that I could use a music printing program at a point in time when actually there were hardly any laser printers. So you had plotters with pens and moving back and forth on a, on a piece of paper. But at Stanford, they had already the XGP, the Xerox graphics printer. They had, uh, there was one person spending half time of his work in maintaining this printer. And MIT Media Lab had one too, and, and, and a few, few places. And it was developed from the fax machine. And it was the first kind of matri uh, the first Yeah, no, it was not it was it was really no, it was not imprinted, but the the, the dots were actually ink split. Yeah. So so this was then it was possible to actually, and there was no language like postscript yet. So the how the programs communicated with the printer was very complicated. And again, I took it all as granted. But if you look at the page which I did, where I designed my own symbols and where I had to make sure that everything aligned, which the program certainly supported in a great, great way. And then using tech as a non-tech person. So I used the fonts, which today you find everywhere. At that point in time, you did not find a printer where you could use many different fonts. So I took the stories which I told you about in our improvisation group, which we recorded on tape, which my friend transcribed, and I took them and put them in a different font format where the content would actually reflect the, no, where the typography would reflect the content. And this is then, in the Dada tradition, something I was able to make by using many different fonts for a totally absurd text. And yeah, so, so this was basically the change over in printing and the influence of graphics. I was then, between 1988 and 1990, I was hired to actually do the change over from traditional engraving to electronic music printing in the largest German and one of the largest European publishers shot. And I spent two years, I had never touched a DOS machine at Windows, so I had to learn all that stuff. But I was working with a group of five traditionally trained engravers who had never touched a computer. And since I had to learn it the way I had to learn it, by not knowing anything about it and just doing it, I was able to introduce them how to use a computer for that music printing, for their music printing profession using the program score at that point in time. Before I get to music which I made with computers, let me jump right back after I finished my two years at Stanford and the text I read you about the creation of the computer, which was done for Computer Träume, Computer Dreams, in 1979. So I came back after two years of computers to a country where no one knew how music would be done with computers, or maybe there was a handful of people. And I decided in the series which we curated of events to do an evening 
on computer dreams and looking from different perspectives on how computers and music and AI, from my perspective, were coming together. So you can invent a little story around what happens if a machine composer lifts his hat and what rises out of his subconsciousness, especially if he's standing in Antarctica. Even the best and most outstanding composers did not consider it unseemly to set music for these delicate and wondrous boxes. The purity of the mechanical interplay of the wheels and springs is only surpassed by the tender melodies and chords these jewels of horological craftsmanship beget, brought to the tenderness of life through the immaculate movements of the apparatus. From the strong ropes, mighty barrels, and man-high statues of carillions up high on towers, to the abundant sound colors of mechanical organs, to the fragility of a music clock, a singing nightingale, they all bear witness to the alliance between the homo faba the craftsman, and the muses. But this seems only to be the beginning. Audacious dreams appear in front of my inner eye, resound in my ears. Right here, right in front of me, I see an enormous mechanical orchestra, like an organ with its endless connections of stops and pipes, the movements of human players have been meticulously recorded and are now brought back to life through most complex gears, pulleys, and barrels. The conductor is replaced by a steam engine that noiselessly executes its driving task. I see music masters stopping the machine, enter into it, change a few movements of the mechanical violins according to their imagination, eliminate wrong notes, accelerate and retard the all-controlling machine. There, suddenly, while still playing, the whole orchestra shrinks. Now it is the size of my study. Now it sits right there in front of me on my desk. I cannot distinguish all its parts any longer. Everything is enclosed in a wooden case with a round opening covered with a fabric out of which the full sound of the orchestra emanates. The magic box now plays a piece of mine. Human-like voices come in and blend to unheard tones and sounds. The harmonies I dreamed of rise in the beauty of the celestial spheres, unclouded and transparent. They fill my study, embrace the world. Everyone can hear my music. I'm certain someday we will fulfill this dream. We'll re we will reach the mediation between subjective stirrings and objective motions through machines of utmost refinement. Machines which preserve and play back the music of centuries. Machines which are directly governed by the creative will of the music inventors. Machines which create a sounding universe of mutual harmonies.
Ladies and gentlemen, this evening, we are honored to welcome you as the major, major cultural forces in the world of music. We all are excited by this special occasion that brought us here tonight. Over the past minutes and centuries, music revealed itself to us as the highest and purest art, as the most abstract power of human self-expression. Now, today, finally, we have reached the goal generations have been striving for. We found her, the dynamic structural formula which contains, holds, and embraces all creative processes out of which all new and future music will be born. This formula finally proves that all composers at all times were nothing but fishermen angling at times bigger, at times smaller fish out of a broad stream. Today, we know the rules this river followed while blazing its trail. We know the government governing the cybernetic principle underlying everything. We captured the fundamental rules of what was praised in former times as unfettered creativity. The blueprint of the whole building constituted by the rules of musical composition throughout the centuries lies right there in front of our eyes. It became evident that every artist functioned according to this cultural dynamic structural formula. As first step, we succeeded to fully program the music for stores, shopping centers, and recreational facilities, as it was easy to get a handle on the stimulating and relaxing forces of such music. Then we were successful in capturing the overall political developments, as well as the cultural needs of individual beings. For many years now, all popular music for any and all media is fully and automatically produced by our Phantom Studios. Only audience ratings and sales figures have to be fed into the system. Market analyses are automatically computed and counter-cyclical to the dominant musical styles. More primitive forms, as well as protest songs, are automatically generated and fed into the market. Finally, Ultimately, we are able to expand the system to include the realm of sophisticated classical music by capturing the cybernetic foundations for an automatically and continuously self-renewing musical avant-garde. We are indeed extremely proud to present to you tonight the pinnacle of our research, our home composer for the intellectual elite of our society. This device, not larger than a loaf of bread, needs as input only the personal data of its owner. It contains already in a dynamic system all information of the great musical developments of the past. After a few initial test compositions to warm up, so to speak, your home composer will have attuned to your very own personal style of music and both of you will jointly go through the cycles of heights and valleys in a fulfilled creative life. The home composer comes with a lifelong warranty. Excluded from the war warranty is the possibility of your home composer falling silent at a very low point in creativity, which, as it were, depends on your very own personal data. In the rarest of all senses, cases, in the rarest of all cases of such depression, your home computer may shut itself off and commit self-destruction. <laughs> Based on our calculations, such a tragic case is only known to us as a possibility. And we can assure you that through your home computer, you will discover within yourself the joy and relaxation, the excitement and fulfillment of the greatest art we wish and promise you many elevating moments with your home composer. <laughs> so this was 1979. Uh, I would like to play a piece now which I did in 1980. And it's a four-channel piece. It's an old recording. Uh, 
there is noise and hums and clicks and all these kind of things. There are four loudspeakers around you. Uh, and I think actually that even with all the distortion and stuff, you can tell apart what the, is meant to be part of the piece and what not. That's actually quite interesting that we are able to do that. You know Mother Goose, don't you? She has this worn out walk and her voice sounds a little raspy and gongish as a result of smoking too many cigars. <laughs> She's trying to remember all her riddles and rhymes and sometimes she gets confused. And then she hums this little tune she remembers from way back from the medieval ages called there is no rose of such virtue as is the rose that bears Jesu. And then she gets even more confused, which she actually does not mind. While humming this carol, she has visions that the whole world is joining in. But naturally, that is not true. Mother Goose simply spaces out. And then she imagines that she is sitting inside a piano, which is not a very comfortable place to be.
Then in the 1990s, I was asked if I wanted to make some music for an old film for Man Ray, Le Toile de Mer, Sea Star. It was part of a conservatory seminar and performances and events where they tried to figure out how actually music influences and corresponds with films. And so they took a silent film and ask different people to make sounds to it. So I took the piece which you just heard, Mother Goose, and took parts of it and made, a, and made it fit with Man Ray's film. So I didn't modify it, I just cut and splice it. And actually, I, I will show you only two uh, excerpts from that film because the whole film is quite long. And I did not put music continuously under the film, but there are long stretches of the film without any music and any sound in order to balance this silentness and this added layer. So please watch two excerpts from Le Toile de Mer. And if you see these blurry pictures, so Man Wei took actually his film, he, he often put gelatine in front of his, in, of his lens so he'd get these kind of blurry pictures. So two, about three minute excerpts.
When you work with computers and you have a loudspeaker, you can create any sounds which you want to create theoretically. You have a general machine that can make the loudspeaker cone move in any direction. And as we know what all we can hear from loudspeakers, it's obviously the possibilities are endless. If you write a piece for piano or string quartet, there are defined limits and traditions. So the question is, what is more difficult to create an island in the sea of everything is possible versus to have barriers to go up against and mountains to climb? I thought that is, it is really quite difficult to create islands in everything is possible. So the, my goal was to understand and learn what can only be done with computers. And to do that, I first had to understand how the non-computer stuff works. So in order to, so I started to imitate reality, to understand the complexity through modeling it, not in the service of mimicking, but to be able to create something that only the new tool, the computer, would allow me to do. So let me play you a few gestures which are absolutely mimic mimicking with the tools of the computer, but which are all programmed with ASCII, with a keyboard, no interface, no nothing else, just programming it. So let me start. When I was young and I visited my grandparents, I could, because they were hard of hearing, I could hear how they cranked up the news on the TV. I could not understand a word. And I thought I would like to program what that, how that sounds. So I can imagine someone speaking next door, and there is a rhythm like in speech. But I did not filter it from speech, but I just wrote functions to do so. Or <laughs> certain urgency. or a bird kind of creature that inhales and exhales. That sounds very simple to do, but if you have to write it in functions, this inhaling and exhaling while trying to mimic reality or an organic gesture in order to not have to do organic gestures with computer, because now I know how to do it, so I don't have to do it anymore. So I associate that with someone striking over the hair of a person in a kind of a soothing gesture. You heard that before. How do you formalize that? It's so in computer music and other music, the golden mean and Fibonacci and all these things play a major role. And I'd learned a lot about these kind of speculative constructionist approaches in computers. And I wanted to build instruments which were actually based on these kind of approaches. 
which sounded different than traditional instruments, which had not the scales of traditional instruments. Because one of my assumptions was, and maybe still is, what I can do with my hands, I do not have to do with a computer, which is the inverse of how we usually think about it. So I built an instrument, and let me play you the scale. So that's an upward scale. It does not have octaves. It does not have intervals, which we are used to. And then it goes down again. How it's constructed is a total Fibonacci approach. This in interval this interval, the distance between the two notes. Usually people apply these kind of rules to frequencies and stuff. No, it's the interval which you perceive. So this interval plus this interval equals this interval. This plus this. So we are adding up intervals which are perceptually based and obviously, I can build only a limited number of instruments with this. It's interesting, I, uh, I wrote a long piece for computer synthesized sound and these instruments. And it does not sound exotic, the scale in the music. It does not sound like it's out of tune. It is something totally different. So let me just tell you, so I built these instruments. I will show you a picture. I built two of the xylophones, and then I built two, um, two xylophones out of wood and two out of metal. And then I used the same approach in creating sounds in the computer, which I again rooted, connected to what we know. So here is the scale. Um, and as, as I played it, um, I can play only one scale. I cannot start from the next because it's a non-repetitive scale, I cannot, as they say, transpose it and just start playing it from another key and from another key as on a piano, where I can always play a major scale from any key. I could not build that instrument. That would take forever. With a computer, it's quite simple. Now from the second pitch, but the same scale. And it's imitating percussive sounds. So all of a sudden, I have all these different scales. Then I can, if you take the scale and turn it upwards, I can create chords out of that. All the timbres are defined by exactly those ratios. I can give it different shapes. It sounds like voices, but it's not voices. It's not a harmonic spectrum, what we call. It is like a bowed instrument somehow. Or certainly I can make, make it go up in a glissando or go down, which I cannot build. So I try to explore these intersections between what I can build with my hands in the physical world, and I built xylophones, which you can see here, uh, which I didn't bring. And here you see two xylophones and one of the metallophones, and the percussionist is rehearsing on the other one. And I made this long piece on a Kafka text and all these kind of things, and built crates so the instruments could come to Stanford and to UCSD in 86. So this was a big project of trying to merge that, what I can do with my hands in my shop, and that's what I can program with my hands on a computer. Another strange instrument is this one here. And I, uh, I projected the image so you can see what it looks like. Um, basically, this instrument let me play it with this mallet. 
They have all the same fundamental. They bum, 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 bum. But I, if I use a different melody, it hits somewhere else. So. And that is done by shaping the wood, as I showed you there, examples of it. So now all of a sudden, I, what we can do in computer music is we can arbitrarily influence the different components of a sound. But this is a proof that you can actually do it in, quotes, reality, in an equal way. So I have 18 keys, which are all the, which are all the same fundamental. And for those of you who aren't in music, this is like third steps up. Even though, and it's always inherent in, in one physical object. And I learned about these kind of things because I don't think that, I think that most of the sounds we like are inharmonic and not harmonic, but one can discuss that forever. So let me just play you an excerpt of the piece performed on this instrument. And always think it depends where you hit and how hard you hit it and with what kind of mallet, but there's always this kind of same underlying pitch. So you can hear the higher pitches, harmonic partials being integrated into this. And what is one big thing in computer music? So again, this doing it with my hands, doing it in material, and doing it in programming in the abstract world. I would like to come towards the end with two other uh, projects, which are with architects, textile artists, multimedia, intermedia, mixed media, whatever you want to call it. Um, and we did a project in 1982. I got in touch with an architect, Bojek Šipek, who is also a designer, was and Leona Henriksen, who is a textile artist, and they wanted to do a big installation in the Zoderkerk in Amsterdam, right next to the, or right in the red light district. And it was called Taboo, and you can see the empty church, how it was back then. It, it had no use anymore. It's now renovated and it's used as a tourist center. So there was a big group, a big number of people who wanted to bring life to these spaces. And Bozek, uh, as architect, designed walls which were actually built into the, into the church. And so the audience would come in and be in an environment. Uh, it was open every night from 6 to 10. There were actors and dancers. You can see the long list of names and it was an environment you could just walk into. When you entered, there was an actor who was washing your hands on the left. And then the only way into the, into the built environment inside the church is shown on the right side, where you had to go through and enter it. Otherwise, you would not be able to get into it. So you enter it through this slit and I had put two loudspeakers into the, to the right and left. So after people overcame the hesitance of entering that space, they heard the music and they could look into the vast church with the whole built environment around them. And it was like big headphones and you see hardly two fit into that. And they, they stopped automatically and looked into the full space.
So this music was, is what you heard at the beginning when you came in, this kind of minimal music, because this was the cliché area where you entered it. So the layout was, the layout of the whole installation was you entered through, through the cliché and the utopia was at the very end of the church and you went through different stages between cliché and utopia. After you entered, you see the slit in the back through which you enter, you look into this wide field with white sand and kind of feathers looking into the space. There were quite a few actors and dancers and because this was cliché, there was also a person like this. Uh, in the church, two percussionists played on my instruments and filled the whole reverberation of the, of the church. As you can imagine, the eight second reverberation and you have these kind of, these kind of sustained sounds of the they just carry in that church. And the xylophones sound really like big, big xylophones as they are. So just take a look at these pictures. So you see the audience at the right and then da a dancer here. And you see the walls. This is a picture from up above looking down into, into the heart of the architecture. You see a, in quotes, Japanese person working on the marble sand and the audience could, had to go into this heart through the walls guided inside and they were checking the material and you heard the sounds of the music or here's an encounter between an actor and an audience member and the performance did not speak so it was all silent from, from a communication level but what the audience was saying and this is the heart and the dancer. So, final project. This was a mountain outside. So, so this installation was really a big thing, you know, you understand building these walls and doing, building the instruments, bringing the instruments. But then in 19, I guess it was in 1984, I saw this mountain outside of my hometown and I found it totally fascinating. Uh, this is a mine dump or tailings from potassium mining, mining. And it was just sitting there in this landscape. Uh, potassium chloride is used for fertilizer, so it's mined quite a bit this kind of salty stuff, and they have to get rid of the stuff which they get out of the earth in order to get to the potassium. And so I secretly entered that space, and I was in a moonscape, because nothing grows here. You lose all sense of scale. There are no trees, because it's all salt. And as you look at this, you don't know how big or how small this is. Well, you try to find ways of judging that. So I decided that we should do a project here. Halde is the German word for mining dump. Uh, and the event started at 4.45 in the morning. Uh, so people came quite early. And because this, the, the, the surface is very, very crystalline, surface. If you fall down the, one of those sides, it will just rip off the flesh from your, from your hands. So everyone who then came to the event at 4.45 was given sturdy gloves. And they entered it, the valleys, which I just showed you before, through a wall which had been built and was continued to be building. The event lasted for two and a half hours. People were divided into three different groups and were guided through the landscape where several things were happening. Uh, you see the wall in the back? 
which is getting finished, and you see people sitting in this valley, and they are sitting around a string quintet that played a very soft piece I had written for this valley and concentrated in this space without scale where actually the, 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 the hillsides would reflect the very soft sounds. That is me. And some of you might have seen the sub-bass prototone, which is out here at MPAC. So these are predecessors of that. So I'm sitting next to an organ motor, which is actually blowing air to two instruments. And I'm feeding it with, as you see, I'm feeding the organ motor where it inhales, sucks in the air with incense. So you have this incense going over the landscape and lowering. Here I'm playing on a great bass ocarina which I built where, where you see the, where the air is coming through the pipe, through the PVC pipe. And a colleague of mine is building a smaller version of the sub-bass prototone and we are playing a little piece for these people and otherwise they would just play sounds the whole time. Then the textile artist had created landscape in this non-landscape, so to speak, without scale. And actors uh, performed, it was pretty ritual, the whole thing. So you see this painted red person. And in the back, and, and the audience was guided in these groups, and there were places where they could sit for a while and watch what was happening. In the back, you see this great white circle. And over the one and a half hours, um, Leona, the artist, uncovered a skeleton of, of a big flying dinosaur. So she had laid that out, as you can see in the bottom right picture. You see this kind of skeleton like there, and she just uncovered it over the course of the time. Another artist actually changed the color of, of a section of the mountain. So she had prepared it, and she had been in touch with the envi environmental agencies. So she had prepared it that if she would spray something over it, it would turn red, and then she would again make the color disappear. So she was climbing up the mountain and down the mountain, making the color appear through a hose, which you can hardly see because you see it's, it's really big, <laughs> the, the site. Then she also had brought many big glass panes on top of a mountain and was building card houses out of it. And because it's not very even the surface and the wind was blowing, then sometimes it would just crash and was gone and then the next one would be built. That also went over an extended period of time. What you see here, people sitting in one place and if you look closer at the top, you see strange things hanging over the, over the top of the mountain, like flowers. And this, these are actually bells, bells from for, which I had connected with a tuba. So a tuba has valves, and you can unplug them and plug in hoses. And then instead of the four outlets of sounds, which are usually used to get different pitches out of tuba, you had these things reaching like flowers over the top of the mountain, which made very low sounds uh, going through the... And you could not see the tuba player. He was hidden behind the mountain. Uh, this is the partial xylophone there, which you can see, and you can see fire running over the crest of the, of the hill. over the course of time. Uh, here you see a tea pavilion, which was totally covered by walls, and the artist took the walls down, and then you saw this postmodern kind of tea pavilion with a beautiful lady stepping out into the landscape of, into the moon landscape. In the back you see three people carrying instruments, and those were instruments which I had also built, which made bird-like cries with aluminum. So if you imagine I'm blowing into this, and here's a big aluminum sail, and I turn it, then the sound 
go, gets projected into different directions wherever I turn it. And there were these kind of big figures walking with their aluminum sails, aluminum sails over the mountain and creating these bird-like sounds. And then it was all over and people went down the hill at 7.30. And it came to my mind, some of you might have seen MPEG 360, which we did at the, in the middle of the building where we actually had events all throughout the construction site and the audience was going around the building. This reminded me a little bit of that. So let's look, uh, watch a two and a half minute video, which the National German TV station did so you get an impression of what it was kind of like there and don't mind the German. Dann war auch Wolfgang Kabisch. Ich wünsche Ihnen jetzt schon einen weiteren schönen Abend. Bitte um Nachsicht, dass wir wieder einmal ein bisschen länger geworden sind. Das lässt sich bei einer Live-Sendung eben nicht immer ausschließen. Und danke jedenfalls für Ihr Interesse. Viertel vor fünf im Morgengrauen. Eine Menschenschlange bewegt sich mühsam ein enges Tal hinauf. So geschah es letzten Sonntag am Stadtrand von Hannover. Oben erwartete die Frühaufsteher nicht etwa der freie Blick in die weite Natur, sondern das düstere Bild einer kargen Landschaft. Architektur, Musik und Installationen auf einer stillgelegten Kali-Abraumhalde. Mit dieser Ankündigung hatte ein Zusammenschluss von Künstlern aus verschiedenen europäischen Ländern gut 200 Zuschauer in die befremdliche Landschaft gelockt. Da wurden an einer Stelle als Spurensicherung die Salzreste von ihrer schmutzigen Oberfläche befreit, an anderer Stelle tauchten zwischen vieldeutigen Installationen archaische Figuren auf. Im Kontext mit unterschiedlichsten Tönen und Klängen entstanden beim Betrachter immer neue Suggestionen von beeindruckender Kraft. Eine künstlerische Gratwanderung wurde hier versucht, ohne verbindliches thematisches Konzept für die einzelnen Akteure. Dennoch griffen die Aktionen nahezu nahtlos ineinander und ergänzten sich in ihrer Wirkung. Im Laufe der Veranstaltung verdichteten sich die anfangs noch willkürlich wirkenden Bilder. Der Umgang mit dem Material, dem Kaliberg, erwies sich zunehmend als überzeugend. Die in drei Gruppen eingeteilten Zuschauer vergaßen über die Geschehnisse in dem Salzgebirge recht bald die nur scheinbar weit entfernte Zivilisation. Und die Künstler hatten sich in der Wildnis inzwischen häuslich eingerichtet. Mit ihren Mitteln hatten sie die Eigenheiten einer Landschaft genutzt und erfahrbar gemacht, die wir in der Regel übersehen. Als nach drei Stunden der letzte Zuschauer das Tal wieder verlassen hatte, blieb ein symbolisch durch eine Mauer geschützter Ort zurück, der als Forum für experimentelle Projekte nun zwar entdeckt, in seinen Möglichkeiten jedoch noch lange nicht erschöpft ist. So, thank you very much and um, thank you for coming.